Um, I'm Jerry Berman, and I'm the chair of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee um, of over 200 organizations that work together uh, with the Internet Caucus to help educate ourselves, policymakers, and the public about the challenges that face an open, decentralized Internet. Uh, I think that's been our vision from narrowband to broadband. Uh, we share that vision, and I, we want to make sure that there's security and privacy and commerce on the Internet. I think that these are significant, and I am understating it, critical times for the Internet. We face changes in the way business is being done, worries about how open the Internet is going to be. We face privacy challenges um, uh, based on national security and also uh, consumer lack of confidence based on identity theft, uh, lack of privacy rules for the Internet. Those are topics that we're going to discuss. I want to introduce uh, uh, Rick Boucher, who's the co-chair and founder of our Internet Caucus on the Hill. Uh, he is a leader in these issues. Uh, he's an expert, and he's here to introduce uh, Chairman Barton of the House Commerce Committee, uh, who has to deal with the telecommunications right and all these issues. And I, with no further ado, I want to introduce Rick. The, the forum and the process will be that he will introduce the chairman, the chairman will speak, and then it will be open to questions uh, to both of them about uh, the policy agenda and the challenges that we face uh, in this coming year. Uh, with no further ado, Chairman Rick Bowser. Jerry, thank you very much. And I would like to join with Jerry on behalf of the four co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus in welcoming everyone to our second annual State of the Net Conference. We appreciate very much your attendance today. And I want to compliment Jerry and Tim Lorden, the very fine staff of the Congressional Internet Caucus Foundation, for the outstanding work that they've done in organizing today's conference and the work that they do throughout the year and organizing a, a series of forums and workshops where we bring knowledgeable speakers on both sides of the critical Internet-related issues that are pending in the Congress. We want to make sure, as the central mission of our Internet Caucus, that when these critical issues are decided by members of Congress, they do so with a deep base of knowledge. And we do bring the very best speakers every year to these workshops uh, and to this State of the Net conference uh, who are the leading authorities on both sides of, of these critical issues. And I again want to thank Jerry and Tim for the outstanding work they do, not only with this State of the Net conference, but in organizing those workshops throughout the year as well. As the Internet has grown and flourished, it has transformed the way that Americans work and play. It has transformed the way that we receive information today from a wide variety of sources. And I see that trend continuing. But as that trend advances, every year we have before the Congress more critical issues, more controversial issues that affect the future of the Internet. And this year is certainly no exception to that trend. We have pending before the House Energy and Commerce Committee legislation that will enable local governments to offer broadband service, driven largely by the availability now of new generations of Wi-Fi technology that are highly efficient and very affordable. We are considering in our committee legislation that will enable telephone companies to obtain a facilitated franchise in order to offer multi-channel video service in competition with cable. Some telephone companies would have to get as many as 10,000 local government franchises in order to serve with television service, their entire service area, a process that, to say the least, would take a very long time. 
and to facilitate the arrival of multi-channel video, we're considering a kind of a one-stop federal shop where a license could be obtained to offer service throughout their territory. Perhaps the most controversial issue that we will confront this year is the question of network neutrality. And the resolution of that subject, I think, will determine the very future of the way that services are delivered across the Internet in future years. And I would call everyone's attention to the luncheon talk by Vint Cerf, who really did found the Internet, where he will address that critical issue. He will be the luncheon speaker and will devote his comments this morning to the question of network neutrality. Congressman uh, Lee Terry from Nebraska and I are poised to introduce in the House a measure to reform the Federal Universal Service Fund and its various mechanisms. And among other objectives, we are seeking to make universal service funding available for broadband deployment. We're hoping to drive a center line between the competing interests of those companies that are primarily contributors to universal service and the rural telephone companies that are its primary beneficiaries. And we think we've achieved a pretty broad consensus with the measure that we will soon be introducing. All of these measures will be referred to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and to its subcommittee on telecommunications and the internet. And presiding over the full committee, managing the debate and giving direction to all of these important matters is a highly capable chairman. I consider Joe Barton to be a personal friend. He and I had the opportunity to work very closely together when I had the privilege of serving as the ranking Democrat on the Subcommittee on Energy and Air Quality, which uh, Joe chaired for, I think, about eight years before he became chairman of the full committee. We approach those issues oftentimes from different policy perspectives, but we always, without exception, work together in a close bipartisan arrangement in order to form good national policy. And during the course of that time, we developed as well a personal friendship. And now he is doing a tremendously capable job in chairing the full Energy and Commerce Committee, just in the area of telecommunications. In the slightly more than one year that Joe has served as full committee chairman, he has shepherded from a standing start to an enactment into law the digital television transition, a tremendous accomplishment for anyone during an entire tenure as chairman of a full committee, and he has accomplished that within the space of only one year. And he's got many more years to go as full committee chairman, and I'm sure we'll have a much uh, more lengthy series of accomplishments during that time. We're very fortunate to have him here today. I asked him if he would keynote our opening session. We couldn't have a better opening speaker, and, to, and I'm very pleased that he accepted that invitation. And so at this time, I would like to ask that you join with me in welcoming the Chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Joe Barton. Well, thank you. You've all heard about the hideaway offices in the Capitol. It's not a well-known secret, but it is somewhat of a secret. Well, Rick Boucher has a hideaway chair, you know. He's in the minority, unfortunately from his point of view, fortunately from my point of view. And um, so he doesn't have a hideaway office. He has a hideaway chair. You won't see him on the floor when we're voting, or seldom, except to go vote. But if you need to, and I need to see him a lot, I know where his hideaway chair is, and so I'll go out and find his hideaway. I'm not going to tell you where it is, because then you'll find his hideaway chair. Although it would be tough for most of you to get to it, because it's in a members-only restricted area. So anyway, I go find him, and whatever it is we need to talk about. And then I always, almost always ask him, now, Rick, how many Democrats can you bring with you? And he almost always answers, I'm really not sure. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he asked me, how many Republicans can you bring with you? And a lot of times I have to say, I'm really not sure. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm here because Rick Boucher asked me to be here. I'm breaking three rules 
right now as I stand here, and I may be breaking a fourth. One rule is I don't do breakfast. I'm breaking that rule. One rule is I don't come to Washington until an hour before the first vote of the week. And I came up yesterday so I could do this this morning. Um, I just had a heart attack, and I'm not supposed to eat sweet rolls. I just had a sweet roll. <laughs> and if we change all of the um, ethics rules, and uh, I'm probably breaking a fourth rule because I didn't pay for that sweet roll that I ate. <laughs> you know? So that's how much affection I have for Congressman Boucher. And I do want to let the record show that my, my telco counsel is here, Howard Waltzman is here, but the senior staff on the Energy and Commerce Committee that just said, I had to do this, they're not here. They're probably still home warm in bed. They will know when I get back to the office that they weren't there, <laughs> they weren't here. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about why you guys are here. At 325 this afternoon, I'm going to be in either the Oval Office or the East Room of the White House to watch the President of the United States sign the reconciliation bill or the budget reform bill. And, you know, that's kind of a 50 50 issue. But as has been pointed out by Congressman Boucher, in that bill, is the digital television transition bill, which means February the 17th, 2009, all the broadcast signals in the United States of America are going to be broadcast digitally. And I think that is a very good thing. We're going to auction off some of the spectrum that we're reclaiming from the from the television stations, that's going to, according to the CBO, raise about $10 billion. According to the real world, about $80 billion. Uh, we're going to introduce much better television quality in terms of signals. We're going to unleash all kinds of good things in the private sector as this spectrum is allocated on a market-based fashion. We're going to give more spectrum to the uh, first responders and law enforcement officials and try to put an end to the problem that we saw, you know, first so visibly back on 9-1-1 when they couldn't communicate in New York City and most recently in New Orleans when literally uh, to communicate in the Superdome they were sending runners across the Superdome with flashlights. So we're going to, lots of good things about the digital transition and I'm very proud that I'm going to be there. Now the question is, Later in the year, will I and Congressman Boucher and others be invited back to the White House for another bill signing ceremony? Now, I want to give you guys a little secret. I like going to the White House for bill signing ceremonies. It is fun to stand there and watch something happen. I've done it two or three times this year. I got to go out to Albuquerque to watch the President sign the Energy Act, which is another thing that that Rick and I worked on and Rick was so helpful on. Now, I, I will tell you that um, President Bush is not quite as much fun to go to bill signings as President Clinton was. I know that's hard for me to admit, but when Clinton signed a bill, and I only got to one or two of his, how many, how many ever congressmen were there and senators, there'd be that many pens. And if it was a big bill, you know, sometimes he would sign his name W, one pen, I, two pens, L, three pens, L, four pens, I, five pens, A, six pens, M, seven, all the way, each letter for his first, second, and third names, one at a time. And then he'd turn around and give everybody a pen. Well, President Bush doesn't do that. He uses one pen, blue, and he doesn't give it to anybody. <laughs> so it's kind of a bummer to, on that side of the equation, you know. You get a nice letter, we're so glad you're here, you get a nice photograph, but you don't get the pen. So on the energy bill, I went to um, Andrew Card, his chief of staff, and Carl Rove, his political advisor, said, I don't care what his policy is, on the energy bill, I want a pen. 
that he really used. So he's going to have to use two pens or give me the pen. I don't care which way it is, but you just tell the president that I told him that. And I got a pen. Now, I don't know if it's the real pen or not, but I got a pen. <laughs> but he didn't turn around and give it to me, so I'm not sure it's the real pen. But I say it's the real pen. Anyway, I say all that because we really want to get a comprehensive uh, telecommunication reform bill to the president's desk this year. If you look at the Telco Act of 1996, and you look at the state of the industry today, now I'm, I'm talking broader than just internet, I'm talking the whole telecommunications industry in the United States of America, it is substantially different. And if you go beyond the Telco Act of 96 and you go to the underlying base telecommunication legislation of this country, some of it's not really been updated since the, uh, the New Deal of President Roosevelt back in the 1930s. In fact, uh, Sam Rayburn, the famous speaker of the House from Texas, uh, before he was speaker, was chairman of what was then called, I think, the Interstate Commerce Com Committee. And um, he helped legislate some of those base bills with uh, President Roosevelt in the 30s. So it's really, it's, it's time that we uh, bring the uh, telecommunications legislation into the 21st century. And I want to do that in a comprehensive fashion. I've been working with um, Mr. Upton and Mr. Pickering and Mr. Mr. Markey, Mr. Dingle, Mr. Boucher and others to try to put together a comprehensive bipartisan bill. We want to introduce that this month. Uh, we want to hold hearing on it and we want to go to markup this month or early next month. And uh, Subcommittee Chairman Upton and I will meet with Mr. Markey and Mr. Dingle and Mr. Pickering later this month. In fact, we're going to do it this week. We can't do it this week because we're only here today and tomorrow. But we're probably going to do that next week. And we've had tremendous progress. You've never lived till you've been to one of these principals only meeting with the senior staff and you guys know everything there is to know about this stuff. And us principals know just enough to be dangerous. And so we'll get off on the most esoteric thing as we debate back and forth. You know, an example would be if you're going to let, and Rick talked about this in his introduction, if you're going to let there be a national franchise, what do you do in a community that only one national franchisee wants to participate in. Do you have a market-based competition or do you have to have two before, there's re before you let them have the national franchise? You know, and, and, and Ed Markey and I will get into these long philosophical debates about, you know, he chooses some little town in Massachusetts and I choose some little town in Texas and, you know, how, you gonna, how is that going to work? And we get to arguing with each other, and pretty soon he's, he sounds like me and I sound like him, which is really dangerous, let me tell you. So we are going to try to put that bill out uh, for public review very quickly, and we're going to try to have a hearing. We're going to try to go to markup. Now, I'm not going to go through all the, the details, but, but we are going to try to touch on every major issue that this conference is going to be focusing on. And the first question out of the box, when we do questions, if, and I, don't, I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to answer them or let Rick answer them. I, you know, I learn more by listening to him answer a question than, than I do thinking about some of these things myself. But it's going to be, well, what are you going to do if the Senate won't take it up? I'd like to say shoot the Senate, but that's, uh, you know, I don't want to get off on that one. But um, we'll come to that um, bridge when we have to. Right now, what I've instructed our staffers is, again, on a bipartisan basis, let's put the best bill possible out there. And let's put the most comprehensive bill possible out there. And then we'll make whatever accommodations we need to make as, as we go through the legislative process. 
And I will say this on the timeline, we don't have that many legislative days this year. So it, it is time to stop talking and it is time to start working. Um, and uh, I plan to, to push the subcommittee and push the full committee uh, to, to create movement. I do believe if the House shows that we're willing to act, uh, that we have a better chance to get the Senate to, to act with us. I think if we just wait on the Senate, I, I don't see much happening because some of these issues are, 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 are complex and I don't think the Senate is as far along generally in understanding. And the individual senators, some of them are right on the beam, but uh, generically the, the Senate as a whole I don't think is focused on as much as we have, we have in the House. Uh, talk about some, some other issues that we're moving. Uh, we're going to mark up next week a data protection bill in Cliff Stern's subcommittee. Uh, that's a bipartisan bill. Uh, Mr. Dingell and Mrs. Schakowsky uh, have worked with, with myself and Congressman Stearns. And uh, I believe we have reached resolution on, on, on the outstanding issues. Uh, and so we're going to move that. American people are absolutely outraged. If you know, we, we, we talk about wedge issues and we talk about, you know, the various issues that drive the American public. You want to get a 95-5 issue in your town meeting or your, your newsletter questionnaire, ask people about data protection and identity theft. I mean, it's a slam dunk. And so we are, we're going to have a very strong bill uh, come out of, come to full committee next week. Uh, we've already marked it up at subcommittee and it passed, but we had an agreement with Mrs. Schakowsky and Mr. Dingell that we'd work between subcommittee and full committee on a, a handful of issues. We've got resolution on those, I believe, and we're going we're gonna to bring that up. Uh, Congressman Boucher has a bill called Fair Use. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of co-sponsors on that bill, but I'm one of them. And that kind of reminds me of a story. I am a founder of the Asthma Awareness Day on Capitol Hill. My son, my oldest son, I have a son 35 and I have a son five months, so I have to identify which son now. Uh, my oldest son uh, is, is asthmatic, not strongly so. So anyway, I'm a founder of Asthma Awareness Day. And, and every year, uh, for the last 12 years, I have introduced a bill to bring some research dollars and some funding for, for asthma, to do some things for education on asthma. You know, it's not a really big bill, but it's one of these, you know, that you want to show the group you're trying to help that you're, you're with them. So last year, and, and I mean every year, when we have Asthma Awareness Day, somebody in the audience will always raise their hand, you know, what are you, what are you gonna, what's the status of that bill? And every year I would say, well, we're working hard on it, we're getting co-sponsors. Uh, and and I, I promise that I'm going to ask the chairman to move the bill. And uh, nothing ever happened. So last year I went to Asthma Awareness Day and they raised their hand and they said, Congressman, what's the status of the bill? And I gave the answer, we're working hard, we're getting co-sponsors and I'll ask the chairman to move the bill. And she lady says, you are the chairman. So we moved the bill. <laughs> so it is now law. So sometimes it's not how many co-sponsors, it's which co-sponsors. And um, fair use is a closely divided question uh, in the community. Uh, there are people, there are strong, strong friends of Mr. Boucher and and I would say strong acquaintances of mine. They're not, I'm not loved like Rick, Rick is. But um, they're all for the bill. And I bet a lot of people in this room are for the bill. But if you ask the Motion Picture Association of America, the Recording Industry Association of America, and a few others, they're not quite as warm to the bill. So we are trying to bring everybody to the table and, uh, we haven't scheduled that one yet for a markup, but uh, we are moving to, uh, to, to see if we can't uh, make some progress. And I, I feel pretty good we're going to be able to, 
I won't guarantee a rose garden ceremony on that bill this year, but I do believe that uh, I do believe that we're going to make uh, make some progress. Another bill that would be of interest to this group, um, we have found more and more that people, uh, companies are going out and without your permission, getting your cell phone, telephone number, and then getting your, your records, your cell phone records, and selling it to various people. Anybody has a hundred bucks, they use something called pretexting. And um, it's getting to be a big problem. And uh, I think we're going to introduce a bill this week or next week, put an end to that. And we had a hearing on it last week. And um, as we got near the end of the hearing, uh, <clears throat> I leaned over to, to, to one of the, uh, I think it was Mrs. Schakowsky, and asked her, do you think we're going to have any trouble working together on this bill? And uh, her staffer sitting behind her leaned over to me, says it's going to be a love fest. I like to hear that, by the way. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. And so um, uh, that bill is going to move pretty quickly. So we're going to get that done. So overall, before I sit down and take a few questions, I'm going to tell you what, I, what I've told the President of the United States and his senior policy advisors. Now, this is coming from Joe Barton from Texas, who who uh, made sure that the name Energy got back in the title of the Energy and Commerce Committee. You know, when we took, when the Republicans took over the majority in 1995, they dropped Energy, and it was just the Commerce Committee. And I hated that. And so, um, one of the things that I have done the last four years is get the name Energy back in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Given high energy prices, I'm kind of wishing maybe I hadn't, but anyway. But, you know, I know oil and gas issues. I know energy issues. You know, I can communicate at the highest technical level and the lowest common denominator, denominator level on energy issues. But what I told the President of the United States, the most important issue in this country facing our nation today for economic competitiveness in the world is telecommunications policy. There is no more important issue in terms of generating economic growth, economic opportunity, providing the United States of America with a competitive edge in the world economy than the issues that we're talking about, you're talking about here today. These are big, big issues. They have big, big consequences. And it's very important that people like myself and Congressman Boucher listen to people like yourself and try to get it right. Now, right is always in the eyes of the beholder. But when we came into the room, we were going to the back of the room to get some orange juice. One of my staff assistants was with me, and he was telling Congressman Boucher um, about a, something that really happened. And I'm going to share it with you because it, it, it encapsulates my world vision uh, in, a, in kind of a nutshell. In 1981 and 1982, I was a White House fellow at the Department of Energy. I worked for the Secretary of Energy, James B. Edwards. Now, White House fellows are people that are, think they're a lot more important than they really are. Uh, but the particular year that I was a White House fellow, I think there were 14 out of about 2,000 people that applied. And you get to do a lot of neat things. And one of the things that I got to do was go to a cabinet meeting in the White House with, uh, with the Secretary of Energy. Secretary Edwards, and he said, Joe, would you like to go with me to the White House this afternoon? I'm having, we're having a cabinet meeting, and would you like to go? And I said, Mr. Secretary, I'd be honored to go. And he said, well, there's only one thing. You can go, but you can't say a word. Yes, sir, Mr. Secretary. So we walk into the cabinet room in the White House in the West Wing. I don't know if you've ever been in there, but it's, it's a real nice room, and you got this big kind of a, a diamond-shaped table, and you have all these big stuffed leather chairs, and it, on each chair on the back there's a plaque, and it says Secretary of Commerce and whoever the Secretary of Commerce is. And in the middle, facing across the diamond, 
there are two chairs. And uh, one of them says, Vice President of the United States. And directly across from it, it says, the President. Now, you know that's the President, other than it's in the center of the room, because it's two inches higher. The President's chair is actually two inches higher than anybody else's chair in terms of the back. So we go into the Cabinet room, and the Cabinet's seated by, by seniority of when the Cabinet Department was established. And the President's in the center, and the Vice President's across. And I got to sit directly behind the vice president, who at that time was George Bush. The president was Ronald Reagan. So Reagan comes in, and when he was president, there really was a big bowl of jelly beans in the center of the table. He reaches over, he gets some jelly beans, and he said, gentlemen, be seated. It's time to start the meeting. And he says, what's the agenda? And uh, you remember a guy named David Stockman? David Stockman was, was the head of OMB. and um, he said, Mr. President, the agenda, he, was, he didn't have a seat at the table, by the way. He was standing up. And he said, the, the agenda today is what to do about sugar quotas. And the president, uh, sugar quotas, okay. The Secretary of Agriculture at the time was a guy named William um, uh, Bach or Brock? Bach? Bach. And uh, he stood up and he said, Mr. President, I'm the Secretary of Agriculture, and i got to tell you, our sugar beet growers in the south are hurting and our cane sugar people in the West and Northwest are hurting, and I don't, you know, I want the highest quota possible. I mean, I want the lowest quota possible. We just don't want to let a sugar, we don't want to let a lot of sugar into this country. Thank you, Mr. Secretary of Agriculture. Is anybody else? And remember a guy named Alexander Haig? Alexander Haig uh, was Secretary of State. He stood up, and he sat right by the President, by the way. He said, Mr. President, I'm your Secretary of State, and i got to tell you, you have tasked me with creating the Caribbean Initiative Program, and a lot of our, um, a lot of our people we're trying to help in the Car Caribbean, their number one export is sugar. And we need to let as much sugar into this country as possible to help those folks and to help the State Department develop warm relationships between the United States uh, and these, these uh, small struggling democracies in the Caribbean. And um, the president took another bite of jelly beans and um, he said, well, I, I guess what I ought to do is, is take, the, take our foreign sugar and our domestic wheat and create cookies and export them to the rest of the world. And he laughed about that. But he said, I have... Um, I've heard what's right for the State Department, and I've heard what's right for the Agriculture Department, but nobody's told me what's right for America. And he really said that. And I was standing behind, sitting behind the Vice President. And when the President said that, I couldn't help myself. I stood up and said, wait a minute, Mr. President. I know why I voted for you. The Secretary of Energy was at the end of the room, and he gave me a look that uh, could have killed. But Reagan just kind of looked around the vice president, laughed at me, and twinkled and said, okay, gentlemen, what are we going to do? And uh, they debated what to do and decided what to do. That really happened. You can go back to the cabinet meetings in the White House in the spring of 1982 and look it up. Uh, and so what I try to do is determine what the right policy is and then come as close as we can in the, in the marketplace of ideas that is the U.S. Congress to getting the best political compromise with the shortest delta between what the right public policy is. Now, on the issues that you're debating today, the right policy is hard to determine. This thing about Internet neutrality that you're going to have your luncheon on, it's pretty tough to determine what right is, in my mind, on that. I, mean, I know the general principle. But what I, to conclude, whatever the right policy is, I'm going to work very, very hard in a bipartisan basis to come up with that and get it through the House, work with the Senate, so that Congressman Boucher and I, sometime next spring, or next fall, excuse me, get to go to the White House and have one of these bill signing ceremonies 
And if we do that, I'm going to try to get the president to do two or three pens so that uh, I get one, Rick gets one, Mr. Dingle gets one, and some of those our friends in the Senate get them. So thank you all for letting me come by, and uh, we'll, Rick and I will be happy to take a few questions. Chairman Barton and uh, Congressman Boucher have, uh, are prepared to take some questions from the audience. Tim has the mic. Let's go. I, it's a big agenda. Okay. Do you expect to, hold on. Do you expect to include universal service issues in the bill that you hope to mark up by early March? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I don't sound like it. It's on though. I just have to get it up closer. Yeah. See if I look down and talk into it. <laughs> um, I'm not where Mr. Boucher and Mr. Terry are on universal service. I would repeal it. Now, that's probably not politically possible. So um, um, we're going to have to decide how best to reform it. And, and, and Mr. Uh, Boucher and Mr. Terry's bill uh, I think is a good start, but I'm not absolutely on the same page on that particular issue as, as they are. Let, let me simply uh, add to that that... Did you uh, ask her to ask that question? Was that... Uh, no, but I'm really glad she did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, we, we go forward in full recognition of the fact that there will be uh, many people, including the committee chairman, who have a slightly different view of the Universal Service Fund than Lee and I have. What we're hoping to do is develop a very broad consensus that involves those companies that really would like to see a lot of restriction on fund growth. And this would be the large set of uh, Bell operating companies that are net payors into the fund. Uh, and on the other hand, those companies that are primary beneficiaries of universal service. And we've been working to do this for the last six months. It has not been an easy process, as you can imagine. We've gone through two drafts at this point. We'll be releasing the second one very shortly. We may have a third one before we actually introduce a bill. We're refining. We're uh, altering concepts. We're working to achieve that center line between these diverse interests. And I think we're just about there. And I would hope that when we present that bill, uh, that, that the broad coalition of, of externally interested parties who have stakes in the Universal Service Fund would be able to announce their support for this measure that makes uh, needed changes that they both believe would be appropriate. Uh, Senator Stevens obviously has a very strong interest in universal service. And my guess is that that will be the first measure the Senate begins its work on in the telecom arena. And in all likelihood, there will be a conference sometime this year that will focus on the combination of the various internet measures that, uh, that Chairman Barton mentioned as his talk began, and also the Universal Service Reform Bill. And so the final bill that passes is likely to be a combination of those. That would be my outlook for how this gets handled. You got to worry about a, a group like this that when I walk into the room, except for my paid staff, nobody says hello and knows me. And when Rick comes in the room, half the room says, Rick, how you doing? And kind of touching base, you know, get those kind of questions. It, it, it really shows how plugged in you are. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Questions? Rick, Mike is coming. Congressman Barton, could you tell us a bit more about this resolution on data protection bill? And does that mean we're going to just have a, a data security bill um, without the privacy provisions, or, or are we going to have some privacy provision? What part of Texas are you from? I just love that accent. <laughs> <laughs> I should say Southern Virginia, maybe, huh? Um, well, the, the outstanding issue was, was at, for, in, for 
how at what level do you let some of the state's attorney generals intervene on some of these cases? Do you let, do you let the states uh, enforce some, the law or, or do you require it to be a federal cause of action in federal court? And, and I don't want to go into all the details of the compromise because I don't know that that's been made public yet, but I think we've got a resolution on that. And I, we are going to move the bill um, at full committee. I, I, we've got that scheduled, I believe. I believe that's been publicly announced for next week. And um, I, right now, I consider this going to be a pretty uh, 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 collegial markup. On, on the privacy issue, it's a pure privacy issue. A number of us are wanting to introduce a broader based privacy bill. Congressman Markey and I are co chairs of the privacy caucus in the House, um, with Senator Shelby and Senator Dodd in the Senate. Uh, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a, a comprehensive draft privacy bill yet, but it's something that we're thinking about. Do you want to add anything to that? We have a time for a couple more questions. You get quit while you're ahead. You got that right. <laughs> and do it on time. We're on time, too. <laughs> Thank you very much.